Okay, today what we want to uh, focus on is, is first finishing up just a little bit of detail about these electron plasma oscillations. And so first let me uh, remind you uh, what we had as our dispersion relation um, for those modes, so electron plasma oscillations. Um, what we had as our dispersion relation was that omega squared was equal to omega pe squared plus uh, 3 has k squared v thermal electron squared. Now, uh, you remember earlier we talked about the fact that, you know, waves have different phase velocities and different group velocities and things like that. So what, what I'd like to do now is derive those and then give them a slight geometrical interpretation. And then finally, uh, I'd like to sketch over here our electron plasma oscillations. So if I, um, you know, wanted the phase velocity, well, let me first take the square root of this, and that would give me modes with omega equals plus or minus uh, the square root of omega pe squared um, plus 3 halves k squared v thermal electron squared. Now, if I wanted, and, and for simplicity, we could consider the, the ones with a negative frequency, but, you know, we'll just mostly consider the ones with a positive frequency. It's just a little easier. So the idea then is that we have, uh, if we wanted, say, the phase velocity, we would, that would be omega over k. Okay, usual phase velocity, just omega over k. And taking this, that would be then the square root of omega pe squared plus 3 halves k squared v thermal e squared all over k. And usually uh, we take that to be, you know, in the limit where the thermal corrections are not very small, uh, not very large. This is approximately equal to omega pe over k um, for, I should say, k squared lambda to by electron squared much less than 1. And why do I say lambda to by squared? Well, that's because I, uh, if we take the, this k squared v thermal e squared and divide by omega p squared, v thermal e squared over omega p e squared is just uh, lambda to by. Let's try to make it a little bit bigger. Okay, now, so that was the phase velocity. Now, the group velocity is equal to the partial derivative of omega with respect to k. And it means then this dispersion relation up here. The easy way uh, somewhat to do this is suppose we take the original uh, equation and we just uh, differentiate it. Then what that would give us is just 2 omega d omega is equal to, and the derivative of the plasma frequency, that only depends upon the electron density, electron mass, and that's constant with respect to omega and k, so that's zero. And then I'll have plus 3 halves 2 kdk times the electron thermal speed. So if we then cancel out the 2s on both sides, then we can show that we have d omega by dk, which is the group velocity, is then equal to and now it becomes 3 halves times the electron thermal speed squared divided by omega over k. But omega over k is, in fact, just the phase velocity. So I can also make this 3 halves v thermal e squared divided by the phase velocity. And it turns out this is surely less than the velocity of light. It's of the order of the electron thermal speed. And you remember, um, we had to have the group velocity since that carries information less than the velocity of light. But we really don't care whether the phase velocity is or not, but it typically is, it turns out. Now I'd like to make a, a sketch in some sense of this dispersion relation. So we'll make a sketch of omega versus k. And this is often called a dispersion diagram.
And what does this dispersion relation look like? Well, it's, you know, this thing right here. It's omega is equal to the square root of omega p squared plus 3 halves k squared v thermal squared. So when k goes to 0, it's equal to some particular value, omega pe. And it's sort of like the square root of a quadratic sum here. So it'll kind of go off, and then it'll have some sort of finite slope up here, which we'll get back to in a moment. And at negative k, it does this. And I'll, I won't really sketch it, but there's also, uh, since there's a plus or minus, there's a negative root down here. Uh, but we won't sort of worry really about that one. Now, uh, so the point at which it crosses over is then the electron plasma frequency. And what else do we have? Well, the kind of interesting point that I wanted to get, get at is geometrically in this diagram, if I identify some particular place I'm interested in, what is the phase velocity? Well, it's omega over k. So the phase velocity is just the slope of the line to that particular point. Okay? What is the group velocity? Well, it's d omega dk. So it's actually the slope of the line tangent to the, um, to the, to the line at the point. So if I do my tangent right, that also will have a, uh, a slope, you know, and the, that particular slope will be the group velocity. And then we might also note that while in the limit that k goes to zero, oh, an approximate, well, yeah, in the limit that k goes to zero, okay, uh, our omega is, is approximately the plasma frequency. At what sort of k does this curve start turning up? Well, it's whenever k squared is omega p e squared over v thermal e squared, which it turns out is what is often called k debye, uh, which is 1 over the electron debye length. And finally, we could put a slope on this to the origin, you know, the asymptotic slope up here. So let me just do that. And that slope would be just the, the square root of this 3 halves k vt squared. So it would be the square root of 3 over 2 times the electron thermal velocity. So there's all kinds of slopes you can get into uh, on this particular business. OK, so that completes kind of what I wanted to say about uh, group velocities, uh, dispersion diagrams. And the next thing we, and this was for electron plasma oscillations um, in kind of the simplest possible case, no magnetic field um, and so forth. And in doing this, we had both, well, we had fluid electrons and absolutely stationary ions. Okay, we just neglected the, the ions. The next thing we want to do is we want to talk about so-called ion sound waves, which allow the ions to start moving. But it'll be a special case where the electrons will be adiabatic to get ion sound waves in the plasma. But before I talk about, and then we're going to come back and draw a diagram like this one, including both this result and the same, and a lower one for uh, ion sound waves that move at a slower speed, not the electron thermal speed, which is very fast, but more like the ion thermal speed or the ion speed. Um, but before we do that, I want to give you, in this way of doing things that we're doing things, uh, a very simple derivation of ordinary sound waves like in this room, okay? So this is the, the simple handy-dandy uh, derivation of uh, sound waves. So sound waves in a gas, namely like air in this room. Um, well, uh, by the way, what carries the sound waves for the air in the room? Well, it's the neutral particle collisions. They can transmit along a momentum impulse. You know, the, the voice causes a momentum impulse. So what do I do? Well, I want to start out with a density balance equation, 
which is d mass density by dt plus divergence of mass density times flow velocity is equal to zero. And I also want a momentum balance equation, which is rho mass partial of v with respect to t plus v dot del v uh, is equal to, and what force is on, uh, on neutral particles in this room? Well, there's certainly no, um, what do you call it, no uh, 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 Lorentz force because they're neutral, or at least it's minuscule. So it's just the pressure gradient force, which for an ideal gas law is just minus gamma P over rho mass uh, gradient of the mass density. Now, what's our first stage of calculation? Well, our first stage is always linearize the equations for small perturbations about the equilibrium. You know, we've got a constant density, and then we just run a little, little density on top of that. What happens? Well, we just get d rho mass tilde by dt plus, and the mass comes out, and we just get rho mass zero, divergence of v tilde equals zero. We're supposed to be becoming veterans of this process, so we can do it real easy, you know. And then rho mass naught dv tilde by dt is equal to minus gamma p naught divided by mass density gradient uh, rho mass tilde. And then uh, what's our next step in this process of trying to derive, derive uh, waves? Well, we propose wave-like solutions, right? So, you know, the mass density goes proportional to e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. And any time we have a partial with respect to t, we convert that to a minus i omega. And a, a del, we convert to a i k vector. So we, we do that on these equations. And the mass density equation, one in the upper right up here, just becomes minus i omega density fluctuation plus rho mass i k dot v tilde. By the way, it says we have to have compression, okay, a little bit of, of fluid velocity compression to carry sound waves. And what causes that fluid velocity compression? Well, we look at the other equation, which becomes minus i omega rho mass naught uh, v tilde is equal to minus uh, gamma pressure over mass density times I k rho mass tilde, which says that the gradient in the pressure or gradient in the density, some local gradient propagating along, is what causes the fluid flow velocity to change in a slightly compressible way. Okay, so now what we do is we just, uh, you know, sort of solve these equations for their uh, simplest form. And so the first one gives us that the perturbed mass density is equal to uh, the i's cancel out, and it just becomes k dot v tilde over a mass density in equilibrium. I'm sorry, over frequency and times mass density in equilibrium. And then we solve um, the second equation the flow velocity perturbation equation. And uh, what we get from that, again, the i's cancel out, the minuses cancel out. And so what we get is k um, gamma p naught over rho mass naught squared um, over omega and then times uh, rho mass tilde, the fluctuation. And now, sort of the, the last step is then you take this fluid low flow velocity that's been derived and you stick it into there. And if you uh, do that, then what you find is that you have rho mass tilde times k dot v, uh, or is equal to, uh, and now just sticking it in, uh, 
you know, and just work through it, it becomes uh, k squared over omega squared times gamma p naught over the mass density, um, all times rho mass tilde. And now the two fluctuating masses cancel out, and this becomes a 1. And what do we get for our dispersion relation for this particular case? Well, this then just gives us frequency squared is equal to k squared v sound squared, where the sound speed squared is the traditional gamma times the pressure over the mass density. So that's just ordinary sound waves in a gas or, you know, in, in this room or something like that. So uh, now let's talk a little bit uh, about the properties of these. So uh, say properties of sound waves. By the way, if I put in... Um, Viscosity, I could get a plus k to the fourth correction here uh, for viscous damping and then an imaginary part so that waves wouldn't propagate forever. But we're not worried about quite that much detail. Um, what's the phase velocity of these waves? Well, the phase velocity is omega over k. Omega over k is clearly just the sound speed. What's the group velocity of these waves, which is d omega over k, dk? Well, again, omega is plus or minus kv sound. So, in fact, it's equal to v sound. So these are waves at which the information propagates at the same speed uh, as, the, uh, as the phase velocity. Okay. And so what does their dispersion diagram look like? Well, here's omega and here's k, and it's a kind of dull straight line diagram, right? So this is omega equals uh, plus kv sound. So uh, sound waves are, are sort of uh, uh, simple uh, type things. Um, and all, all waves, uh, all sound waves... And I should say now neglecting viscosity, actually. Propagate at the same speed. Now, if that wasn't the case, then if you were listening to my voice, you'd hear, you know, if there was some uh, change in this difference between the phase velocity and the group velocity, and in particular if the group velocity depended upon k, then different waves would arrive at different times. And you would have the situation that uh, the, uh, you would hear certain tones, you know, high tones, low tones, at different, uh, you know, before you would hear the other one. But sound waves don't propagate that way. Plasmas, however, we've got that happens all over the place. Uh, various waves propagate at various speeds. Okay, so prop uh, neglecting viscosity, travel at the same, propagate the same uh, phase velocity, phase speed, and um, call it group velocity. Remember, group velocity is the rate at which I transmit information, so modulation or information. Now, in regular sound waves, you don't distinguish between electrons and ions because sound waves are molecules in a gas, and there's only one type of molecules. You might have more, but you add them all up in this sound speed and stuff. On the other hand, in a plasma, we certainly have two components, electrons and ions. We first did this calculation for plasma oscillations, and we had both fluid electrons and fluid ions. And we got a dispersion diagram 
types of waves, which looks a good bit different than the sound wave type propagation we've got now. Okay, it was this bell-shaped thing. Group velocity was different than the phase velocity and so forth. So question, and by the way, this was propagating ultimately at something like, the th with a phase velocity, like the electron thermal speed. Well, that electron thermal speed, remember, is much faster than the sound speed because that's determined, maybe I should have put that down, V sound, of course, is equal to the square root of gamma P naught over rho mass. But effectively, this is the square root of gamma times T over the ion mass. It's because it's the heaviest mass that's around. And that turns out that'll be the ion mass. So actually, these sound waves are propagating much slower. You know, if they were propagating in a plasma at the ion thermal speed or something, uh, they'd be propagating much slower than electron thermal speed type things, which would be one over electron, square root of one over electron mass. So the question becomes, can we have anything like regular ion acoustic uh, sound waves uh, in this room? And the answer is yes, but to do so, it turns out we need to have adiabatic electrons and fluid ions. So that's the, the next uh, case we want to treat. Uh, and it's kind of what kind of sound waves do we have in a plasma. So they're often called ion waves. Um, they're also called uh, ion acoustic waves, or acoustic waves even. Uh, or even ion sound waves. Various people call them various different things. Now, in the gas in this room, it was the collisions between molecules that gave us the transmission of this pressure perturbation through a flow, you know, compressible flow perturbation and so forth. Um, what's going to transmit the wave in a plasma? Well, it's the electrical interactions rather than the thermal pressure interactions. Um, so it's, it's, uh, well, the waves travel basically via the electric field or the charge imbalances or the potentials, the minuscule potentials. Okay, so let's talk about now the assumptions we'll use basically to make the model simple um, to derive these ion waves, ion sound waves. First one is no magnetic field. And also, I should say, we're going to treat an electrostatic case. So E is going to be um, minus grad phi. Um, second, so we're just not facing up to the magnetic field. We'll, touch, we'll start into that next lecture, it turns out, later part of chapter 4 of Chen. Um, the second one is we'll, we'll, as usual, not face up to geometry. So we'll say we, we have an infinite homogeneous plasma. And also with no flow or electric field in equilibrium. Uh, these are all, again, just simplifying assumptions. If you remove them, life just a little bit more difficult. The next one is we'll treat now in order to get these ion waves, we'll need to do something a little different than we last, did last time. And namely, what we will do is say that the, uh, the ions are, or the, sorry, the electrons are adiabatic, okay? And what we mean by that is that the phase velocity of waves, by the way, is much less than their ion thermal speed. We'll come back to that later. And we had derived earlier what such a response was, namely it was the so-called Gibbs distribution or the Boltzmann response or various people call it various things, namely Ne is equal to N naught E times E to the E phi over Te. Now I'm going to need the linearized version of this, which is the departure from equilibrium. And how do I linearize e to the e phi over t for a small phi? Just expand in a Taylor series, 1 plus e phi tilde over t. 
So what I find is that in any tilde, the varying part due to a potential variation away from zero, which is what I need to make my electric field be there, um, all I get then is Ne is equal to E phi tilde over Te times N naught E. Now, uh, just remember this relationship, this adiabatic response relationship. Uh, the remainder of what we're going to talk about uh, are, is calculation of the ion response. And so we'll, uh, we'll just remember this. And when we have to come back and put, put it in Poisson's equation, uh, at that point we will come back and um, use it. Okay, final assumption is that uh, the ions which we will assume are protons. So we've got an electron-proton plasma, um, are fluid-like. Now what we mean, of course, by that is that we have our density conservation equation and our momentum conservation equation. So uh, next what we'll do is proceed to write down those ion fluid equations and solve for a fluid ion response. And then we'll put it together with this adiabatic electron response, which is different than we did for the electron plasma oscillations, because there we let the electrons even be fluid-like. Um, and then we'll put it all together in Gauss's law and get a dispersion relation out of it for the waves that could happen. I should have said fluid-like is the opposite limit here, which is effectively that the phase velocity of waves is much greater than the, uh, it turns out, the ion thermal velocity Ah, which makes me see that I have a mistake up here. If I want to make the electrons adiabatic, I ought to talk about something having to do with the electrons. So that's an electron thermal velocity there. Um, phase velocity has to be small compared to the electron thermal speed. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get our ions fluid-like and start manipulating equations. Um, so uh, fluid-like ions. And what do we have here? Well, uh, our density conservation equation, these are getting to be old hat by now, dn, dni dt plus del dot ni vi is equal to zero. And uh, then our momentum balance equation, mi ni, and I'll just abbreviate it now as dvi by dt, uh, is equal to uh, e ni electric field minus gradient ion pressure. But uh, in a moment here, I will be perfectly happy to make my electric field is minus grad phi. And to make my grad pi as just gamma ti times grad ni. And again, our first step is we don't want to solve anything complicated. So what we do is we linearize about uh, the equilibrium that we have. And if we linearize, what do we get? Well, we get partial of the perturbation in the density with respect to T plus the equilibrium ion density and times the compressibility del dot VI tilde equals zero. And the momentum balance equation just becomes mi n zero i partial of vi tilde with respect to t is equal to uh, minus e n sub i uh, grad phi tilde. And then I would run off the page if I went over there, so I'll just put it on the next line minus gamma Ti, and Ti is now a constant, and grad Ni tilde. Again, a little check on the business to make sure we're not goofing up too badly here is to say that um, um, you know, we only have one linear, one linear quantity in each equation, one tilde quantity. And if you look through, I was lucky I did that. Okay, what's the next step in these wave-like derivations? Guess they're going to be waves, right? So propose 
What quantities? Well, the things we got varying here seem to be the ion density, uh, the ion flow velocity perturbation, and the potential perturbation. And we propose that they all go like e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. And then, therefore, we are going to replace partial with respect to t with minus i omega and gradients with i k's. So after we do that, um, we can then get our density evolution equ density equation here is minus i omega n i tilde plus i k dot v i tilde n naught i is equal to zero. That's my density balance equation, and my momentum balance equation becomes minus i omega m i n naught i v i tilde is equal to minus e n i k vector with an i in front, I guess, uh, phi tilde, and then uh, minus gamma t i i k n i tilde. This all gets a little tedious on a slide, but frankly, it's not very complicated mathematics, so just manipulations. So we can solve that, namely ni tilde is then going to be k dot vi tilde divided by omega uh, times the equilibrium density n naught i. And our momentum balance equation we can also solve again by just uh, dividing through by all of that. And we can get vi tilde is equal to Uh, n naught i e, that's that, and we have an i k, the i's all cancel out on here, so maybe I ought to just take care of those. Um, and then we divide through by uh, m sub i omega, and then we've got a k vector phi tilde. So that sort of took care of the first term. Then we have to subtract or do the uh, add the other term. And there we have gamma ti divided by um, mi omega and then times uh, ni tilde over n naught i. So the perturbation density over the equilibrium density. Okay. Oh, and we need a k vector, a k, uh, yeah, k vector here. Okay. And again, our strategy is. You know, uh, question is, did I lose? Oh, I, I should have lost a k and n naught. Let's put it that way, because I got an n naught there and an n naught there, right? So I should have lost that one. So we'll obliterate it. How's that? <laughs> Looks kind of bad when you obliterate it, but nonetheless, we'll just obliterate it. Thank you. Uh, that would have shown up in a little bit here. We'd have caused a fatal mistake. Okay. So what now happens? Um, well, uh, we now have to substitute this ion perturbed ion flow into the uh, perturbed ion density. So let's just uh, do so. And what we then get is that the perturbed ion density is equal to, and now I'll let you see what I'm seeing, and you can help me get it right. Um, so basically, we're going to take k dot all of this. Let's first take an n naught i i out in front, just to simplify things, and over omega, and then we just take k dot everything in here. So we get e over m i omega and then k dot k times phi tilde, and then plus gamma ti over mi omega, uh, ni tilde over n naught i, and then again k dot k. So that's just, of course, the scalar k squared. Uh, 
Now I get the n naught i, which I was looking for. Uh, and so what this becomes is n naught i e over m i omega squared all times k squared phi tilde. So I took that in. Now I take it into the second term as well. Uh, and there the n naught i cancels out, and I just get gamma t i over m i omega squared. Um, and then there's a, a k squared, and then just an n i tilde. So here I have that n i tilde is equal to something with an n i tilde on the right, so I can take, you know, and combine this term onto the left hand side as 1 minus stuff, and then I can divide through by stuff. Um, and so what I get then is n i tilde is equal to n naught i e m i omega squared k squared phi tilde divided by stuff, which is 1 minus this. So that's 1 minus gamma t i, now off the bottom of the page, um, gamma t i over m i omega squared uh, times k squared. This at least looks like a sort of k squared v sound squared over omega because the sound speed is sort of the ion temperature over the ion mass with the um, ideal gas law factor gamma. Now, it's convenient to go a little bit further here and multiply through by omega squared, okay, because the omega squared will make an omega squared minus something downstairs. So let's just do that, and so it becomes n naught i e over m i times k squared phi tilde, and we'll divide that then by omega squared minus k squared times some speed gamma t i over m i, which is something like the ion thermal speed. Okay, so what now is, is next on the agenda, so to speak? Well, um, the next, maybe I'll even start a new page because it gets a little bit complicated to say it. Um, well, let me summarize it so I can see it when I'll need it in a moment here. So we'll get n naught i e over m i. Um, and then k squared phi tilde divided by omega squared minus k squared gamma ti over mi. Now, what we next need to do is to go to Gauss's law because we don't know the potential here. We need electric fields equal to minus grad phi, Gauss's law to see what's going on between the perturbed charge density um, and the um, and the current and the electric field and hence the potential. So let's do Gauss's law. And this time I'm going to neglect the so-called free charges, which, you know, free could be any one particle or it could be a, an extra particle, a mu meson that comes through the plasma or one particular particle chosen out of the plasma. Since plasma has 10 to the 19th of them, you can consider any one of them as more or less free. Uh, but we'll neglect that here, and I'll also take only the linearized form of Gauss's law, because we always do that anyway, right away. And that's supposed to be rho tilde over epsilon naught. And what's the perturbed charge density? Well, that will be E over epsilon naught times Ni tilde minus Ne tilde. Now remember, we're at the moment trying to derive sound waves in a plasma, and we have both electrons and ions active. That is to say, they're responding to an electric field or a potential fluctuation in the plasma. Namely, the electron density is, is giving us a Boltzmann or adiabatic response, and the ion has the fluid response that we derived on the previous slide. And, a comment, and I'm going to need in a moment, of course, that E tilde is equal to minus grad phi tilde. And so that's our linearized form. The next thing we do is uh, suppose wave-like solutions. So we suppose that E tilde goes like E to the i, uh, k dot x minus both phi 
and e tilde goes like e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. And again, partial with respect to t goes to minus i omega, and gradient goes to i k. So our equation becomes i k dot e tilde equals i k dot electric field is then minus i k phi tilde. But that's equal to minus i squared, so that's minus i squared times k dot k phi tilde. So maybe I should have come off to the left here and said divergence of e tilde goes to. Okay. Uh, and minus i squared is about plus 1. k dot k is k squared. So this is just equal to k squared phi tilde. So we um, stick that, and then, okay, this was this, and so uh, we can then revise our Gauss's law to simply k squared phi tilde, and now I'm going to put an epsilon naught in here, I'll just uh, to give stick the epsilon naught up on the left hand side, is equal to e n i tilde minus n e tilde. Now. All we have to do is substitute things in. What was the ni tilde? Well, the ni tilde um, was equal to n naught i. Uh, I'm looking at the preceding, so I'll let you look at it too. Uh, n naught i e over m sub i. But then there was a k squared phi tilde divided by omega squared minus k squared gamma ti over mi. So that's my ni. What did ne turn out to be? Well, it was just that adiabatic response. So it's n naught e times e phi tilde over te which was the adiabatic response. So that's the adiabatic response. Now, the interesting thing when you do all of this is you sort of readily note that now we again have epsilon naught k squared phi tilde is equal to a bunch of things that are also proportional to phi tilde. But if you remember, what we usually end up doing is saying, well, Gauss's law, we've been driving as divergence E, but it could also have made it divergence D, as in displacement vector, and D was epsilon E equals zero. So I can get an effective dielectric constant then. I can write the whole equation as something I'm going to call epsilon hat, uh, k squared phi tilde equals zero. Four, and now what is my epsilon hat? Well, first it's a function all of k and omega. And it's equal to one, which is the vacuum response. Okay, so that's the vacuum response. And then the next part is this business here. And so, and I've got to take it over to the left-hand side. Actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to bring this one over first. I want to put in the electron one first. So we'll make that plus, and that's an n naught e, uh, and I've got an e squared, and then I've got to divide by, and now I have, I'm normalizing out. I'm not showing you that, but anyway, we'll take a divide by epsilon naught there. Uh, and so I've got to divide by an epsilon naught te, and now I've finally got a 1 over k squared. So that was my electron response. Which were adiabatic, or Debye shielding electrons is what it's going to be. Uh, and then I finally have the ion response, and it has a k squared phi. Okay, And so, but it'll be a minus. So it'll be n naught i e squared over 
m sub i epsilon one naught. So that's that part. Uh, everything up sort of up top. And then this will all be divided by omega squared minus k squared. Let's move it up here where we can see it. Gamma ti over mi. And again, this is our ion response. So how do we look at and what, what do these various terms mean? Anybody remember what n naught e e sub squared e, e squared over epsilon naught t e is? One over the Debye length, right? So let's uh, do this. So what we've got is that epsilon hat of k and omega is going to be equal to epsilon naught times one plus one over k squared lambda Debye electron squared, which is effectively going to give us Debye shielding. Now, what is this quantity n naught i e squared over m sub i epsilon naught? Well, if it was the same thing for electrons, n naught e e squared over m sub e epsilon naught, I would have called it the electron plasma frequency. So now we'll just call it the ion plasma frequency divided by omega squared over k squared gamma ti over mi, where we have defined omega pi squared is equal to uh, n naught i e squared over mi epsilon naught. So this is our dielectric constant for adiabatic electrons plus fluid ions. And in a moment, um, we'll discuss setting this equal to zero and hence trying to look for uh, so-called normal modes in a plasma. But we'll take a little break right now.